Hi. So you want to quit drinking? Well, stop putting alcohol in your body. Simple, right? Hello and welcome to another episode of Hug Me, I'm Insane. My name is Perry Johnson. Today, I'm going to talk about the many back doors of my addiction. And so what do I mean by that? Well, Essentially, what I mean by back doors of my addiction, I'm, I'm ta- when, I, when I say that, I'm talking about things that put me on a slippery slope to a relapse, to, to bringing me back to pre-recovery, back to using. And there's been a few things that have been problematic for me. Early recovery, uh, certainly hanging out with my old using buddies was not good simply because uh, I came from a life of chaos and upheaval. And so many of my friends were also operating on that level. And I, and, and that's not a criticism, it's, it's, it's just an observation about where where we're at. And when I came into recovery, I didn't hear from any of them anymore. I mean, I stopped contacting them as well, but I it, there's that saying, different playground, different playmates. And I, I know that particularly when I'm not doing well, I want to go back to what I know. I want to go back to the coping mechanisms that I know. And hanging out with the old crew in my mind seems like a good idea because I hearken back to the periods that were good, that, that where I was having fun. Because it wasn't all hardship and destruction, although it certainly evolved into that. But, you know, I ended up in recovery for a reason. And it had to do with my decision making. It had to do with my thinking. And the drugs and the alcohol and, and my social circles were a byproduct of that thinking. And so there's that saying, fake it till you make it. And... I, I was taught to do things, to, to do things, in order for me to survive, I, I needed to start doing things differently. One of the things that that encompassed was, as I said before, new playground, new playmates. And it just wasn't in my highest interest to continue hanging out with the old crew. And so I, I was, I was, you know, I had a lot of support around that, and because I was, I was, I was resistant, and I, I hung on to a lot of old phone numbers of my buddies. And the truth is, is that if I called them, they would all have access to dealers, and 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 I knew that if if I was calling them, they'd be going out. If they weren't using, they were drinking, and so there was some aspect to it where my brain would tell me that, oh, I just want to check in and and you know see see how so and so is doing, and that you know I I love this person, like you're somebody important to me. At least that's what my brain told me, and those kind of back doors can be pretty sneaky because they're they're masquerading as friendship and companionship and and even and even love. And it's not like I didn't and don't love those people. As I said, it's just that I'm now operating within a different paradigm. And so I had to change that up. And, and, and it wasn't easy because I had to mourn those, those friendships. I had to say goodbye to not only the life, but the idea of the life. And, and I, by that, I mean, I, I really glamorized and idolized and, and idealized the idea of scratching the underbelly of society and, and moving within these surreptitious circles of, of the underground, including drug culture. And, and, and it was a large part of my identity. And, I, and, I, and you know, even in terms of, of literature and authors that I gravitated towards, it was people like Bukowski and, and Burroughs and and Hunter S. Thompson and these sort of outcasts, you know, these rebels who were, who who were known for being notorious users. And so I stopped reading that stuff, not because I don't think that their writing is invalid. It's just that it stopped being as relevant to me in terms of what it was that I wanted to achieve. And so the social aspect of of recovery to me was a big part of it and that and that continues to this day in terms of relationships and and how i view my codependency because there's also a big a big aspect of that is is coming to terms with and really examining my codependency 
I've yet to meet an alcoholic or an addict who doesn't struggle with some iteration of codependency. And and it makes sense because addiction really is having a a very, very maladjusted relationship with the self and therefore the world. And so it stands to reason that when I get into a relationship, whether it be an intimate relationship, romantic relationship, or a friendship, that I'm looking to have a part of me validated, like fulfilled in the way that I'm not doing that for myself. And one of the things that I had to learn was the distinction between you and me and what's my stuff and what's your stuff. So today I'm very mindful about what I am able to do for people and what I'm not able or willing to do for people. And that comes as, as a result of, of really getting clear on personal boundaries as a way of addressing and mitigating my propensity for codependency. So that's all wrapped up in that too. And, and in terms of, of having back doors, I know that when I get kicked into feelings of envy or jealousy or, or, or not feeling a part of, that's usually a, a pretty good indication. It's a pretty good red flag that there is some work that I need to do because that has nothing to do with the other person. That's 100% to do with me. So relationships in terms of having back doors to addiction can have a really seriously detrimental effect And so I have to really be mindful about that. I've seen many people taken down by the demise of a relationship and not just a romantic relationship, but friendships ending. And the net effect is is that we invariably get kicked into shame because there's this aspect of rejection and abandonment. And so we naturally get pushed into the shame. I'm like, there's a part of me that's not good enough. There's a part of me that's unlovable that's been rejected. And so now here I am alone again. And I've said this many, many times, but out of all the feelings, out of all the emotions, the one that addicts, alcoholics in recovery struggle with the most is shame. Because that's the lowest vibrational energy we can feel. And the difference between guilt and shame, by the way, guilt says I did wrong and shame says I am wrong. And so that wholesale rejection of the self is, as I said, the lowest vibrational energy that we can feel and the one that I want to run from and turn off and numb the most. More than guilt, more than, more than sadness, more than hopelessness, more than anger, more than all of those feelings, the very bottom one is the shame. That's the, that's the separation from the self. I really have to be mindful in terms of relationships about getting kicked into shame. I'm, I'm still not great at understanding when, when I am in shame, but I'm a lot better than I used to be in early recovery. I'm, I've got, I get a pretty good sense of that shame feeling now, and more importantly, I can name it. And it's important that I'm able to name it and to be able to verbalize that and communicate that to somebody in my support group and talk about it, because that's what takes away the power. It's internalizing that stuff and holding up and isolating into some other numbing mechanisms like either gaming or television or a, or a bucket of ice cream or a relationship or sex or work or scratch and wins, like whatever it is, those are not healthy ways of dealing with feelings because really they're just aspects, uh, they're just uh, other aspects of that same mechanism that brought me into recovery in the first place. Other backdoors? Replacing one with the other. So some of you may have seen people or have experienced yourselves coming into recovery and, uh, you know, like say you get sober and you're, you're no longer drinking and all of a sudden you're smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Or you're like going hard on the bong or you're suddenly doing 12, 18 hour days at work, doing a lot of double overtimes, whatever it is. The, the replacing one for the other can also be a backdoor because inevitably there's a reason why we used what we used uh, because it worked the best for us. 
Addiction is, 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 is nothing more than a coping mechanism. And then eventually that coping mechanism stops working. That's what brings us into recovery. But if we're not properly processing our feelings, because it's not about what's happening in our lives, it's about how we're feeling about what's happening in our lives. That's the stuff that's motivating the behaviors. If we're not properly processing those feelings, then eventually we're going to burn out from the 18-hour days or the person that we're that we've been having sex with for 10 days in a row is going to eventually reject us or we run out of ice cream and whatever the hell it is it's it's really it's like it's incumbent on me as somebody in recovery as part of working a good program that I'm really mindful about what it is that I'm feeling that's that's really the key and and continuing to take the right action in terms of working a good solid program working my tools and staying hooked into a recovery community however that looks not just talking to your bestie but actually talking to and giving permission to somebody who has suffered in the way that you have and has some recovery and 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 has some experience in using the tools who will understand your mindset because your bestie is as, as close as you might be at the end of the day, unless they're also in recovery, they're not going to understand the addict mindset the way somebody in recovery will. When, when you get out of treatment or, or when you get sober, or when you get clean, who's going to be your support group? And please don't make it your partner. That's the worst thing you can do. If you love that person, do not make them your accountability partner. Because if you relapse, they're going to not be able to not internalize that, to use a double negative. And that's just a very cruel thing to do to somebody. Like, I'll, I'll talk to anybody about anything, and, and I'm, I try and run an honest program. But when it comes to my inner landscape and validating what's actually going on in my head, I only will relay that stuff to somebody else who's working a sim- similar program to me, who's on a similar path to me in terms of my recovery. If your thing is food, you need to find somebody who struggles with food, who gets it. Same thing with gambling. Same thing with working too much. Same th- anything, anything that puts us out of balance, the, we have to surround ourselves with a tribe of people who have suffered in the way that we have and, and have something that we want outside of our normal lives. In fact, the focus, if you really want to be successful in recovery, that has to be the focus. We don't fit recovery into our lives. We fit our lives into our recovery because putting recovery first means putting myself first. And that's a very difficult concept because, as I said, many of us are codependent. We're not used to putting ourselves first. We're used to putting everybody else ahead of ourselves. So this is getting a little tangential, and I'm I'm talking about a, a number of concepts here. Outside of the obvious stuff, like don't go into bars, <laughs> you know, stay away from the liquor store. The back doors of my addiction for me have been around these more slippery, surreptitious ways of, of getting kicked into difficult emotions. And that's the thing that I really needed to be mindful of, especially in early recovery and even today. Especially today, because as as we go deeper into recovery, we, we align with this false sense of security but that's exactly what addiction wants us to think i am my own worst enemy and the only way to know if i've let the wolf in the house is for you to look in the window i can't tell if there's a wolf in the house i'm the house so i hope that you got something out of that that's all i'm going to talk about for now until the next time i'll see you soon Mm -hmm.